can everyone hear me okay? Raise your hands if you, if you can hear me. Awesome, thank you. Okay, uh, thanks to Oxford Nanopore for the opportunity to speak here today to you. And I've got a narrative I'm gonna try and weave together between several different uh, disparate projects that bridge between the extreme and the everyday. And uh, sometimes we see that the everyday is just as extreme as the extreme. Um, and uh, my work has been trying to bring together DNA sequencing so that in extreme environments, it's an everyday thing for us to do the DNA sequencing. I'm not doing this alone, and I'd like to acknowledge, uh, first of all, funders uh, ranging from Merck and the Leverhulme Trust uh, to um, Montclair, a, a down clothing company, um, and they've sponsored my alternative career as a, a fashion model on the Greenland Ice Sheet. Um, but particularly my team, my team of early career researchers, uh, Alia Debener, uh, Melanie Hay, Andre Suarez, uh, Joe Cook here, uh, and uh, Sarah Rasner, and then my colleague in Aberystwyth, um, Andy Mitchell. Uh, so we've been um, very grateful for, for the inputs from my colleagues to, to come to extreme places and do DNA sequencing, whether that's uh, live on uh, national broadcasters or in the depths of the green and ice sheet in, in, in the middle of winter. So first of all, the obvious extremes, and the first project I'm going to talk about is sub-zero sequencing. So can we take DNA sequencing to a, a very, very harsh environment, the harsh environment where the thermodynamic default is your own death within hours. If you just sit down in the snow at those temperatures and those wind chills, you, you're gone. Um, and can you actually just go from, from survival to actually delivering quality data that provides insights into climate change? I've been fortunate and cursed in that about a quarter of my adult life has been spent uh, in the Arctic and, and basically watching it die. And uh, a lot of what I've been doing is essentially been going there, collecting samples, returning them to the UK. So the start of my career is essentially uh, looking at small holes and, and what lives in them. But by now I'm looking at the small holes using even smaller holes by nanopore sequencing. And um, I think that's a more sustainable and, and uh, responsible way of doing this science for several reasons. This would incur a delay of several months, bringing the samples back to the UK and then processing them using large grey boxes. Um, whereas if we bring the sequencer out into the field, there's a much lower carbon footprint from just doing that. But also we're getting our results while we're there and able to respond to the change. And, and this boils down to a statement we've heard a lot from, from this young person recently, but uh, earlier on last year she made this comment about we can't solve a crisis without treating it like a crisis. And we're facing a crisis in how the Arctic is changing rapidly uh, due to all our carbon footprints. This is mine here through a, a collaboration with an artist um, being shown there. So field sequencing allows us to respond to global challenges by um, sequencing in very specific locations. One of those locations which is a massive hotspot of climate change impact is the western edge of the Greenland ice sheet. So here, largest island, uh, third largest ice sheet on the planet, and if we melted all of this, we would be having this meeting underwater because I think it would raise sea level by about eight meters, and I think we're just about at eight meters elevation here above the Thames. Uh, so understanding how this is melting is, is critical. And it is melting in large part because the darkening of the surface ice is making it melt faster, absorbing more solar energy. And this isn't a glaciology talk, this is a, a, a genomics talk. And what I'm interested in is the genomics of the organisms that are growing on the ice surface, which make it darker and melt. And so we want to understand the future of the ice sheet by looking at its past, because what goes into ice is often archived and then moved down and then re-emerges at the surface. And we're interested in the dusts and the microbes that are then emerging out onto the surface. We could look into the past and the future of the Greenland ice sheet simultaneously by taking ice cores deep within into the ice, but this is a multi-million dollar endeavor, lots of logistics. So it's cheaper if you're braver or can find brave people to work with you, people who are willing to dangle off bits of string and climb down inside drainage shafts into the bottom of the ice sheet. And so this is what we've set out to do as a means of looking at the microbes that are now arriving at the surface, having been entrained inside the ice and carried down for up to millennia. We have no handle on the past uh, or of these microbes or which microbes are re-colonizing uh, the surface. So in 2018, we set out to go to the Greenland ice sheet in October, uh, right at the start of the winter when the temperatures are really cold because then there's no melt uh, running through these channels. And this is quite a serious endeavor. You have to sign a piece of form that certifies you know what you're doing, but also that you recognize that the temperatures there will be about minus 30 and that you might encounter hurricane force blizzards. 
And so this is, this is a significant challenge for operating in that environment, and it's a particular challenge for sequencing in that environment as well. So the first lesson to impart is that you must really prepare carefully before going to these environments and trial things. And so before leaving um, Aberystwyth University, we set to work through our entire workflow and test its compatibility with these extreme conditions. Sequencing in temperatures colder than your freezer at home is actually reasonably straightforward, provided you do two things. Firstly, ONT specification laptops must be hardened. This is a military-grade ONT spec laptop that can operate at minus 30. That's the high-tech bit. The low-tech bit is that simply insulating a min-iron sequencer inside an insulated container, perhaps with a hot pack, is enough to maintain a stable plus 34 temperature, even if the ambient temperature around it is minus 20 or colder. So this is a, a recycled NEB uh, polystyrene box, which was critical to our su sequencing success in this environment. Nanopores are amazing things, and nanopore flow cells are amazing things too. But one of the critical issues is that if your nanopore flow cell accidentally freezes, it will die. So this is an environment where you must keep your flow cells above zero. We tried all kinds of things with hot packs, various exothermic reactions, lots of insulation. All of them failed. In the end, the only sustainable heat source that we could think of was our own bodies. So for two weeks, I walked around the green and ice sheet with my flow cells inside a small pelican case and inside an insulated jacket. At night, it would go inside my sleeping bag and I would sleep with my flow cells cuddling up to them to stay warm. I would monitor the temperature of my flow cells using a Bluetooth temperature logger, and if it got too cold, then I would uh, sort of have to start to do jumping jacks to start to warm it back up again. But it worked fairly well. Our flow cells didn't freeze. Getting the samples is, is an arduous process. It involves caving deep inside the green and ice sheet, and this is my collaborator, Dr. Joseph Cook here, uh, who, who's responsible for that part of the project, uh, chipping out microbial biomass from deep inside the ice. Conditions on the surface were not gentle either. We got hit by a hurricane-force blizzard halfway through our, our sequencing um, uh, project. And so many of our team members were working constantly to make sure our tents didn't blow away. Our only lifeline in this environment is the fact that you can stay inside a tent, eat warm food, and snuggle up in a sleeping bag. But you have to maintain that by being outside in zero visibility, uh, shoring the tents up. That wasn't good enough. At one point, we did actually lose some tents. And it took about half an hour for me and my colleague to crawl the width of this room to move a person from one tent to the other. And this is the selfie we took inside that tent. I like to think of this as the sheep and the haunted abattoir look, because outside, you know, hurricane force winds and all this, and inside, um, we know that we're in for an uncomfortable night. Doubly so for Joe, because he was kept awake by my snoring, not the wind. But it can go from violent to serene and actually sublime. And um, this is why we go to these environments as often is the, is the interest that we have in them. And I'm now going to take you inside what I think is the coolest sequencing lab on the planet, inside this tent here. So collecting our microbial biomass, we were able to extract the DNA. But we immediately ran into a problem because I was an idiot. And I forgot one out of 164 different items critical for our success, the reagent for doing the quantification. So we ran around doing various kinds of things and trying to improvise different things. But in the end, we had to sacrifice a flow cell, which I'd bought especially for the purpose of being a, an old flow cell that was likely to just fail on me at some point uh, just to try things. And from that, we realized we had to concentrate our library a little bit more using a standard Ampua cleanup. And then eventually, we got to sequencing success uh, on our second run. So what are the insights that we gained from this? Well, we had cryoconite from inside the moonland, inside the green and ice sheet, presumably old cryoconite. Cryoconite collected from the surface in the summer uh, during a different project, and then cryoconite from the surface during our winter trip. And so we were able to see a very coherent microbial community between all of those. And I'm just going to pull out two of these. First of this, a member of the chloroflexi called Catanodobacter. And from reassembling the genome for this organism, not achieving a complete uh, contiguous assembly, uh, but we could identify that this has genes for carbon monoxide metabolism and also all the genes that we think are required for an oxygenic photosynthesis. So this is a new insight. These are new metabolisms that we, we hadn't seen before on the green and ice sheet. But the key player here is PP, and I'll tell you a little bit more about PP. So here we have um, the um, phylogenetic tree based upon haplotypes of the internally transcribed spacer 
from s the ribosomal RNA operons that we've reconstructed from the metagenomes. And we could slot in our MinIron data just neatly inside Sanger data that's been compiled from all over the world. And we could see that the current strain on the Greenland ice sheet matches what we have in winter and summer, and then deep within the ice sheet. So this is telling us that the same ITS haplotype has been stable on the Greenland ice sheet for quite some time, centuries to perhaps millennia. I'm not the only person foolish enough to do this. Uh, you should check out sledgereport.com to see Glenn Gowers, who's just back from Iceland, adopting the same kind of strategy informed by our experience in Greenland. Uh, go there and you'll see exactly how people go about sequencing intents. From one extreme to another, carbon dioxide is our culprit. So shoving carbon dioxide back into the ground and hoping it stays there is an increasingly important strategy. And microbiology comes in here because, of course, there's a subsurface microbiome, and there's also uh, the potential of using carbonate-forming microbes, rock-forming microbes, to seal the carbon dioxide in. So with some American collaborators, we were interested in, in looking at whether we could monitor this process on site in a trailer at a, a study site of theirs in Alabama. So we went there in December, um, and I think I could summarize it by analogy to, the, to a well-known TV program where essentially inside this trailer, all things were being cooked up. 48 gallons of sporocyna pasteurii in one end, but then also the need to have ultra-clean microbiome and metagenome sequencing in the other end of the trailer. We were dealing with DNA extracts with sort of nanogram to sub-nanogram quantities that we could actually generate libraries from. So this was challenging. We'd have to amplify that. We weren't dealing with a real Simon Pure. Instead, we were dealing with 16S data, and we were dealing with whole genome amplified uh, data as well. So firstly, 16S data. I have to say here, our extraction controls were spotless, and we couldn't detect anything in our amplification controls either. So we assumed that this was clean. Our sampler, on the other hand, that was being sent down a kilometer beneath the uh, surface of the Earth was dirty. That's quite common, because it's being used by people who have no mind about microbiology. And you can try and sterilize these things, but it's never perfect. So we could pick up skin bacteria there in the few uh, reads that we got back. But before carbon dioxide was put down, we could see a native subsurface microbiome, halophiles, anaerobes, sulfur cyclers. And this has been disrupted then by the large ingress of uh, surface microbes from freshwater sources. 200 gallons of water were being pumped down unfiltered. So this seems to be the major impact. Our shotgun metagenomes, amplified using freeze-dried whole genome amplification reagents and then put through ligation sequencing, provided a very similar story. Our sampler wasn't sterile. In fact, we could pick up chlamydia on our sampler. But when we look at the real sample, we retrieve many, many more reads. And these are subsurface microbes and many methanogens, the kinds of things we'd expect to see. And after carbon dioxide has been put in, this is disrupted. We have surface microbes, and we have uh, fewer methanogens and more phages uh, in that. So I think the recommendation we were able to give our collaborators was that um, they need to filter their surface water before they use that um, to be put down. So, obvious extreme environments. For us, the most extreme, though, was actually skipping from Alabama, rural Alabama, to London the very next day. Very common saying from WC Fields, never work with children, animals, or nanopores. And we proved this uh, to wrong, in a sense, because in the space of a couple of hours, we had animals, kids, and nanopores all working wonderfully happily together at the Royal Institution Christmas Lectures. And for international um, uh, uh, delegates here today, just to give you an idea. This is the one highlight of the science communication calendar in the UK. Every Christmas, between Christmas and New Year, these are broadcast for the last 70 or 80 years. And so we were invited to take part into this and to do some microbiome sequencing uh, as part of the lecture. We were working with two young people, two identical twins, and they were kind enough to give us some of their saliva for DNA analysis. And um, so the brief we had was to actually characterize this using 16S sequencing. This wasn't our first rodeo, nor was the Tyson, uh, Luce, and Lohman boy band the first time we've had sort of this kind of uh, thing going on. Uh, so this is kind of the X factor of the, the um, genomics, uh, nanopore genomics world, where we sequenced at a music festival, some 60 microbiome samples with 16S, four or five metagenomes as part of a TV program. And we learned a lot from that process. Going forward from that, uh, about a year ago, we uh, sequenced live on uh, Radio 4 on the Today program going from collected soil to taxonomic profiles within one hour, 40 uh, minutes, um, just using the equipment on the bench here. 
So we've done this kind of thing before, but this is quite a stiff challenge now because on air you have zero time. 20 seconds is an extremely long time to fill when you're on uh, a camera. So we collected the samples the day before and overnight we did our PCR and our sequencing in the hotel room. And to facilitate the analysis, we pulled through about two and a half million base pairs through our minute. And then Andres Suarez had come up with this one line um, sort of command for analy analyzing this um, using uh, an aligner. So he was able to, in 15 minutes, go from the base called data to taxonomic profiles using just a single line of Linux command. But my challenge was, in 20 seconds, can we go from no sequencing to showing sequencing? Is it real, real time? And as many of us will know, we have to do priming steps, wait 10 minutes, etc., and then prime and load. That's too long. So we came up about 30 minutes before going on air with a new way of doing this. Do all the priming off stage and then live on camera, just drip, drip, drip in the samples. Within about 15 seconds in real time, we were going from no sequencing to producing a fairly good run. By the time I was off stage, 85,000 reads uh, of uh, 16S data had come through. So that was quite a success. But the challenge with this is actually how to communicate our microbiome and metagenome and genomic science. It's all very complicated. This is what Andre had come up with as a taxonomic profiles. But that was too complicated to communicate to a general audience in that brief period of time. What they were interested in is how many species did these twins have in common and how many did they have that were unique? Now, the idea of species is something that's fraught with intellectual challenges for microbiologists. But if you've got to just say that quickly to an audience, then that's what you can go with. They understand species. They don't understand operational taxonomic units, perhaps. So what have we learned? Preparation is essential. Whether you're in the green and ice sheet or whether you're sequencing on television, you have to have trial runs, contingencies, and so many different backups. Your workflow must be smooth, but you must have parallel workflows to avoid problems. We've heard a lot about how sequencing has been governed by Moore's law in terms of its development. In-field sequencing is governed by Murphy's law. Whatever can go wrong will go wrong. So this is just a, a quick list of the things that I've skipped over here where they haven't quite worked out. And you have to be resilient to those things. When you're dealing with television producers, when you're dealing with the general public, and when you're dealing with uh, perhaps commercial managers of projects, they have expectations that this is something which is instantaneous. But real-time sequencing is not instantaneous, and it's not something that's an absolute panacea. So you've got to manage some expectations there. Perhaps we've been conditioned by a bit of a CSI effect. And then, if you're communicating your science to a general audience, it has to be really clear. You have to tolerate perhaps a few oversimplifications. So that's a quite a difficult thing. We revel in this complexity of all this awesome data, but it's difficult to get that through. So from extreme to everyday, a final thought. We are seeing the development of this technology in a way that I think is paralleling the development of microscopes. From one extreme, the first microscopes, to just a few microscopes being in existence, to large microscopes run by powerful institutions, then getting to the hands of notable expert scientists. Can we get it to the everyday of just as common as perhaps a kid with a microscope under the Christmas tree? I hope so, because imagine the impact of this. Many of us in this room will likely have used microscopes as kids. Imagine the impact of having that DNA sequencer one day and just exploring the living world at a new level.